for a long period of time. And ever since that time, which would be sort of probably the 1920s or thereabouts, right around the end of World War I, let's say the fundamentalist orientation has been growing in this country. And it probably has reached its most powerful expression within the last few years. So, as in so many other areas in our lives, in the culture, the world of religion, or as some people who don't like the term religion like to call it spirituality, and you hear these kinds of inane expressions very often, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, you know, well, uh, you know, what do you really mean? In some cases, it may mean something fairly understandable by that, in other cases not. But there has been a polarization which um, has put the uh, evangelical, which just simply means based on the gospel, Bible, literalist and fundamentalist element on one side, and what often is called a secular or secularized element on the other. And so we have a sharply divided scene in that regard in this country, while it would seem that at least for the time being, in Europe that is not the case because religion has entirely lost, at least right now, its grip on the overwhelming majority of the people. So while Europe is almost entirely secular, the United States is only in part secular. Yet, with all of that and with all of these developments, it took this long for the critics, let's say, of religion and also of mainstream religion to direct their uh, criticism and their ire at the very center of all religiosity, at least in the West, namely the Godhead itself. So it's not the moral system, not the commandments, it's not this, that, and the other thing that is under assault. Now God is under assault. Okay? Now, as Shakespeare might say, and indeed has said in one of his comedies, thereby hangs a tale. <laughs> Shakespeare was not adverse to a good pun, or even a bad one. Some people say that there is no good pun. It, 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 it's a matter of opinion. <clears throat> and really the tale that hangs by that issue may be illustrated by a funny story that some of you have probably heard, and some of you may have even heard it from me, but it's worth repeating. I heard it from Joseph Campbell. Mr. Campbell was standing on a street corner in New York some evening. He was very insistent to describe it. He was wearing his tuxedo. He was going somewhere, you know, and waiting for a taxi. And as he stood there, a youthful person, I believe belonging to the Reverend Sun Young Moon's church, a Mooney, as they are affectionately called, came up and started a conversation with him. And the conversation went something like this. Oh, uh, uh, mister, do you believe in God? So Campbell looked at him and he said very seriously, Oh, son, I believe in many gods. Oh, I believe in many gods. Which, of course, as a scholar of mythology, and so he could say with considerable truthfulness. The Mooney was obviously somewhat taken aback by this answer. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he tried to uh, uh, break through this barrier that Campbell had erected. And he said, well, yes, mister, but you know, what about the God, you know, the God of the Bible, uh, the God of our fathers, uh, the God of the Old and New Testament? And Campbell looked at him and seriously said, Oh, yes, that one. Oh, yes, I believe in him too. Uh, and just by that time, the taxi came along and Mr. Campbell jumped into the taxi, waved at the Mooney, and that was the end of the, the, the conversation. Now, you see, this may sound just like a nice, funny story, and it is. <laughs> but it is also something else. There is a 
a profound element here because what so seldom seems to come to the fore in these disputes, including the most recent ones, is very much like what Campbell was alluding to. Which God? You see, which God? And the general assumption is always there. Obviously, it's quite understandable. After at least in most of our countries, not in the United States, maybe that's why the, the religious constellation is a little different here, because it lags behind the history of Europe, you know, obviously, newer uh, country. But it is generally assumed in all of the uh, various uh, countries of Western civilization that God means the specific monotheistic God which we have inherited from Judaism, or let's see, which both Christianity and Islam have inherited from Judaism, and then modified to some degree and extent, and that a God concept, or a God image, as for instance Jungian psychologists call it, means this one singular God image and no other. Now, I contend, and if so many of you hadn't come, and if uh, I would be, uh, you know, ready to cut this very short, I could almost, <laughs> almost sort of quit right now, or we could all adjourn to a friendly neighborhood bar. I, I, think, <laughs> there, I think there is one or two down the road, <coughs> uh, except for us for the... Uh, the triple A folk, or is it double A <laughs> folk, uh, who maybe would adjourn to something else. But let's say, because it is my uh, contention that this is really the crucial issue, and this is where I think, at least on the part of people of a more universal and more profound thought and orientation, have a job to do at the present time, and that is to begin to look at the possibility that the particular and specific God image, God concept, which existed and still exists in our culture, may be at fault rather than the universal notion of some kind of consciousness or being or transcendental existence which may be regarded as the fountain and origin of our world and also of ourselves, which uh, may have characteristics and features very, very different from the God concept and the God image that we are used to. And that therefore it is not the, let's say, the universal and generic possibility of a God that is at issue, but monotheistic Godhead of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as it exists in the world today. Hmm? Now we, just for the sake of honesty and possible completion of the picture, we also have to throw in Zoroastrianism, which is no longer a major religion, and the fact that it is no longer a ma major religion is due to the boundless tolerance of Islam, which has wiped it out in its homeland of Persia and has driven the remaining Zoroastrians into exile in India, where they still exist, and I think there are, by now there are less than a hundred thousand of them the world over. But of course, in typical Middle Eastern fashion, if you talk to a Zoroastrian, as I often have, they will tell you that, of course, they were the first monotheists in the world and everybody else learned it from them. <laughs> so you, you've got to keep that in, in mind also. Now, uh, very few people, I think, in our uh, culture are aware of the fact that, let's say, the monotheistic deity that appears in the Old Testament and that then, as I say, has been adopted 
and somewhat modified in uh, Christian theology and in Islamic theology, that this deity was subject to doubt and criticism of a major nature quite a long time ago, namely right about at the time of the beginning of the Christian era, and indeed it would seem, although we have less precise information about that, for perhaps a few hundred years prior to the Christian era in Judaism itself. And this criticism, of course, eventually manifested in the position of the Gnostic tradition and appears very openly in, in the various Gnostic scriptures, but possibly, at least in part, originated already in the circles